great to see a lot of you, a few friends, and a lot of new faces. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. I like having an opportunity to talk about my work. Um, that's who I am. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, green infrastructure. Hopefully that's a phrase most of you have heard of by now. Um, and basically what my work has largely been about for the last 20 years or so is figuring out how to integrate natural hydrologic processes and natural hydrologic function into an urban environment. The Charles uh, River, as hopefully most of you know, flows right through uh, Boston and Cambridge, urbanized areas, but it starts in a, a, about uh, 26 miles as the marathoners run in the town of Hopkinton and flows in a meandering 80-mile course down to the city. But it's a generally small and urbanized watershed by national standards and a very, very interesting place to have been working and studying and doing all kinds of interesting research. So I'm going to focus on just a couple things um, tonight, a brief outline of my talk. I'll uh, just introduce my organization in case you don't know who we are and a few basic things about the Charles River for background. And then I'm going to go right into the green infrastructure piece. My goal is raise to tie... The mic, raise the mic. Oh, sure. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Great. My hope is to tie in uh, at a very local and site-specific level uh, some of the ideas and, and practices that I think you've been hearing about throughout the lecture series. Um, so I'll sort of make sure everybody's on the same page understanding what I mean when I say green infrastructure, talk about a couple of really interesting historic precedents right here in the Charles River watershed in the Boston area, and then some of the opportunities that my organization and others working in this field have identified uh, specifically in our watershed. Charles River Watershed Association, or CRWA, has been around for quite a long time. We were um, formally incorporated as a nonprofit organization in 1965, so before the passage of the Clean Water Act and many of the important pieces of national environmental legislation in this country. Um, our mission is to use science, advocacy, planning, and the law to protect, preserve, and enhance the Charles River and its watershed. And in order to do that, we have built a pretty unusual interdisciplinary staff uh, at the organization, including engineers, scientists, planners, um, as well as a lot of people working on uh, outreach, education, administration, fundraising, the usual things all nonprofits have to do. Uh, and I actually should have updated my numbers here. I checked in with staff earlier today. We, actually had last year over 4,000 volunteers uh, working with the Charles River Watershed Association uh, last year doing all kinds of things from cleanups to interning and uh, lots of great stuff. So it's a really fun place to work. In case you're not too familiar with our watershed, this is the state of Massachusetts. Obviously in the dark area there is the Charles River Watershed. You might not know that in some places it looks like this. Pretty nice. As you start moving downstream, it might look a little bit more familiar to you. This is in the um, Needham-Newton area of the Charles River. And now we start getting into the more downtown urbanized sections of the Charles. This is uh, in Watertown. And of course, you're probably pretty familiar with this part of the Charles River. It's actually basically a lake. The Charles is really a fairly small river with a modest flow. Uh, the dam at the end of the river creates what's called the lower basin, which is basically like a big urban lake. Another thing you might not know about the Charles is it's had a tremendous successful history of cleanup in the last 20 years. Um, when I first started working at Charles River Watershed Association in 1994, a long time ago, um, the river was extremely polluted and uh, was considered unfit even for boating much of the time. Uh, in the intervening 20 years, there's been a terrific amount of cleanup, uh, started in large part by um, advocacy efforts by our organization 
and work with the municipalities that are along the Charles and the State Department of Environmental Protection and the US EPA. And as a result of uh, all that work, in 2011, the Charles River won the International River Prize for the best river protection effort of any river in the world. So it was pretty exciting. A few brief facts and statistics about the river. As I mentioned, it's 80 miles long, starts in Hopkinton. Um, there are 20 dams along its length, so its natural hydrology has been significantly altered, obviously. Uh, mean annual flow of about 370 cubic feet per second with a fairly typical um, annual hydrologic cycle, so its biggest flows, the most water is flowing in the river in the spring, usually in the month of March or April, its peak flow occurs, and its lowest flows or lowest levels in August or September. So there's quite a bit of variation across the year, and that's not actually because of rainfall variation. The rainfall in Massachusetts is fairly consistent month to month, um, but the main difference is really what's happening with plants. And in the summer months, we have uh, a lot of uptake of water from plants and also a lot of human use. And the, the two combine to really reduce our summer flows. And then once all of the leaves drop and people stop watering their lawns, uh, then the flows begin to come back up. There are 35 towns in the Charles River watershed and over a million residents. It's the, um, so it has the most population of any watersheds in the state. So I'm really going to focus on green infrastructure. As I said, I think that's probably a phrase many of you have heard, or I hope many of you have heard. Uh, when we think of the word infrastructure, we typically think of gray concrete pipes underground carrying water or carrying electricity or something like that. Or maybe we think of streets and uh, buses or things like that. But green infrastructure is a phrase that is increasingly being used as we recognize the importance of the natural environment and the functions of the natural environment, even in our urbanized areas. Um, I think the phrase was probably first used by ecologists and others and was really um, thought of at the landscape scale, which is sort of where I'll start um, thinking about what are the natural large pieces of undisturbed or still functional uh, environment that we have, whether those are rivers, wetlands, forests, uh, etc., and, and thinking about those really at a very large landscape scale. But increasingly we think about green infrastructure now also at what I would call a neighborhood scale, or a sub-watershed scale, or a micro-watershed scale, lots of different uh, ways of thinking about scale, but uh, something that we are more familiar with thinking about our own, our own neighborhoods and understanding how things move through those neighborhoods, how natural processes move through our neighborhoods. So whether it's water flowing through a neighborhood and getting to a river or to a harbor, uh, or whether it's animals moving through a landscape, um, whether it's you know, how, how energy even moves or, or heat and cooling moves through a system um, but thinking about infrastructure at that scale of the neighborhood. And finally, we also uh, use green infrastructure even when we're thinking at the site scale. So the perhaps a, a new building or a new development is being put up and we're, we're thinking about how we can uh, create some green infrastructure and make a system that works even at the scale of a building uh, so that it functions in a more uh, natural way, the way the environment would function. So really, all different kinds of scales of thinking about green infrastructure. These are just some examples uh, that you might think of if you were thinking of green infrastructure at the landscape scale. So sort of understanding where your rivers are, where your forested areas are, where your wetlands are, how things are connected, identifying gaps, very important part of ecology and urban ecology is uh, understanding the patchiness that you have still left. Uh, where are your functional pieces of green infrastructure? How can you connect them and protect them? Uh, obviously, in the water world where we work, 
groundwater and aquifers are also a big part of green infrastructure, even though they're underground and we don't think about them too much. Um, they are certainly important parts of our large-scale green infrastructure. At what I call the neighborhood scale, green infrastructure uh, really is much more within a city or within an urban environment. What is, where is the water? Where is it moving from and to? How is it linked with still functional, uh, perhaps urban forests or even wetlands or ponds? Um, one of the examples that I'll talk just very briefly about and Tom Brady's gonna talk quite a bit more about is the Emerald Necklace. Um, obviously a very interesting and wonderful example of urban green infrastructure. Um, at a, at a neighborhood scale. And finally, at the site scale, this photograph is from the parking lot outside of Community Rowing's um, new boating facility up in Brighton. You may have been there or driven past it and probably didn't even notice if you were there this uh, little green strip in the parking lot. This is basically functioning as a biofiltration system. So when the rain hits the parking lot, and picks up all of the pollutants that have collected there, whether dust, dirt, debris, or materials that come off of cars or from exhaust. Uh, they're all washed into this rain garden or this biofiltration system before they're discharged into the Charles, before the water is discharged into the Charles. So you have a wonderful living, functional ecosystem that's able to collect all this water, use it as a resource, clean it up, and then the excess is returned to the Charles. So a nice example of green infrastructure at the site scale. Green infrastructure in cities looks like all different kinds of things. Urban forest is obviously a big piece of it, even in a very landscaped setting like the Commonwealth Avenue Mall. We also uh, see coming to the Boston area and very common in some other cities already, as these two photographs are from Portland, Oregon. Um, very small scale urban green infrastructure. These types of systems are designed to take runoff from the street that's moved into the gutter by the curb. The water flows into, from the curb, into these little planters, filters through the plants and the soils, and again, the excess water goes back out into the drainage system. Um, even little pocket treatment systems like this have been shown to be extremely helpful in reducing the volume of water that's coming off the, the urban environment and significantly improving water quality and cleaning up uh, pollution. But green infrastructure can also look not so green like this. These are two examples uh, right, right here from um, our area of porous pavement. So you see one strip of porous pavement in the photo on your left. It's not green at all, and yet it's functioning kind of like a natural system. So it's allowing the runoff from the adjacent area to drain through this what looks like pavement and actually uh, go in to recharge the groundwater underneath. And in the photo, I got your right mouse <coughs> backwards, sorry, <laughs> you're right, um, is a gravel infiltration trench, basically, which, believe it or not, takes all the runoff from the parking lot that's shown there on the left side of the photograph. The runoff comes across the grassy area, which takes out the first big pollutants, big uh, pieces of sand and dirt and litter, if there is any. And then the runoff goes into that gravel infiltration trench. And this is um, small, it was very inexpensive, but it's able to treat a parking lot that's over an acre in size. So green infrastructure can look not too green. And, and here's an example of green infrastructure that doesn't have anything green. This is a porous parking area, uh, the parking lane, if you will, of a, of a street that's made with um, porous materials. So. Uh, all kinds of interesting things are happening in cities around the country and certainly in the Boston area to try and naturalize how water works in an urban environment and really 
hold water where it falls, hold on to the rain. It's a terrific resource. And rather than treating it as waste and shunting it off into the gutter and down into the drain and out to the river as fast as possible, increasingly we're seeing um, planners and designers and, and managers and campuses um, turning towards green infrastructure as an opportunity to reverse some of those trends of just throwing away that polluted water and getting rid of it as fast as we can. So we have some really interesting historic precedents in the Charles. Um, and I'm going to just go mention them fairly quickly. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned a little bit already, is Olmsted's Animal Necklace, um, which is a, a very beloved and renowned um, piece of landscape architecture and piece of engineering. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk briefly about the, what's called the Natural Valley Storage Area in the Charles River. The Emerald Necklace, these are obviously, this is a sort of a plan uh, of the whole necklace and then a couple of photographs. Um, the one on the bottom in the middle is kind of a nice aerial shot of the fens and the area that is now covered by the Bowker Overpass where the Muddy River enters the Charles River. Um, the Emerald Necklace, believe it or not, is a completely man-made system of parks and a river. It was originally a big salt marsh, and at low tide it was completely dry. There was no water in it. And as the area around the Fens and what's now the Muddy River developed and people built homes and it became more urbanized and more populated, uh, people at that time didn't have sewers. So they had uh, what are called straight pipe discharges, if you can imagine what that is. It's just what it sounds like. So the idea of, uh, of sewage and wastewater management at that time was basically get it out of your house, off or out of your privy, out, out away from your, your home, and uh, maybe put it in a pipe out into that wet, muddy area, and when the high tide comes in, it will sort of clean it up. And, out to the harbor and you won't have to see it. Well, as it got more and more populated, you can imagine that didn't really work very well. And it became a, a smelly, stinky mess and eventually became a public health hazard. Uh, and Olmsted was hired as a sanitary engineer, not as a landscape architect, but as a sanitary engineer, to come up with a solution to this problem of this terrible, stinky, awful mess. And what he came up with was the Emerald Necklace. He created a river that ran through a park system, and it, it's remarkably successful to this day, 100 years later. It's still uh, a beloved functional landscape. It doesn't function quite as well as it needs to, and that's some of what Tom is going to talk about, is how do, you, how do you manage a system like this in a very urban environment? It's very challenging. It requires a lot of maintenance and engineering. Um, but Olmsted really was a genius and gave us a tremendous gift for, to the region and actually to the whole country, this idea of how do you create space in a very urban place that still is beautiful, wild, functional from a hydrologic perspective, uh, and brings tremendous public health and public amenities, um, public health benefits and public amenities to the city. It's something that we don't um, have enough examples of, and that as we look back on uh, the city and the planning and the design processes we've gone through, we now are trying to sort of replicate or capture uh, some of these ideas wherever we have a chance to do so. But I think it's very valuable to remember that the Emerald Necklace is actually a synthetic created landscape. And as we uh, work in urban environments and work on river issues, we should remember that we can change what's there and make it better. Uh, the other project I'm going to talk about in maybe a little bit more detail is the Natural Valley Storage Project. Um, and this came out of many years of flooding problems uh, in the 50s and the early 60s, so quite a long time ago. 
there were several large hurricanes and big flooding events. The photograph here shows Starro Drive completely covered by the Charles River. And uh, people realized this was going to need a, a, a major watershed scale set of solutions if we were going to avoid having the whole city of Boston flooded once every 10 years. So the Corps of Engineers was brought in to help and try to find a solution. So if you know anything about the Corps of Engineers and their typical style of project, you won't be surprised that one of the major uh, solutions for flooding in the Charles River was to build a big new dam. And you can see here in the picture, um, so right here is the new Charles River Dam that was constructed as a result of this project. And you can see the locks in here. Uh, it was completed in 1978. There are six enormous diesel powered pumps that can pump the Charles River out against the tide. So even if the water in Boston Harbor, the elevation is higher than the Charles, the pumps can still pump water out of the Charles and into Boston Harbor. So the idea of this dam was really, let's make sure as floods are coming into the Charles, we can get them right out into Boston Harbor as fast as possible. There's also a fish ladder there, although unfortunately it doesn't work. So. Now all the fish that come in and out of the Charles River, so-called anadromous fish, migratory fish that go between fresh and salt water, have to be locked in and out through the locks. It's not a great system, but it's what we have. Um, so the Natural Valley Storage Project was actually, it came about because of uh, the Charles River Watershed Association and uh, some women from the League of Women Voters. and a couple of very important local citizen activists. Um, at the time, in addition to building the dam that I just showed you, the Corps of Engineers was considering building a series of dams and dikes along the Charles River in its uh, middle stretches. Uh, that was their approach to solving flooding problems at the time. And the activists from the Charles River Watershed Association and other folks out there um, lobbied and lobbied to get the Corps of Engineers to do what's called an alternatives analysis, which they did. And what they did was go out and actually look at the middle and upper Charles region and try to understand how it was working and what would really be the best solution to prevent flooding. And uh, coincidentally, during their study period, I believe it was 1960. Eight, I'm pretty sure I had the year right there. There was another huge storm that came just, just to help them uh, learn. Was they had about seven inches over two and a half days, seven inches of rain, which is quite a bit. And they were able to really observe how the Charles reacted to that event. In the lower basin, the part that I just showed you before, the peak of the flood came very high and very fast and moved on out of the river very quickly. But in the upper and middle stretches, the peak of the flood moved extremely slowly. In fact, it took several days for that water to move down into the lower basin. And the Corps, uh, as they began to study and figure out why this was happening, realized that it was because there were vast areas of wetlands in the upper and mid middle Charles that were sponging up all of that water and holding it and releasing it very slowly and protecting the downstream from flooding, natural green infrastructure. So rather than build a huge dam and a series of dikes and kind of follow the typical cement gray infrastructure approach of the Corps of Engineers, especially back in those days of the 1960s and 1970s, they decided to protect and preserve those wetlands which were in fact holding uh, about as many acre feet of water as a typical New England flood storage reservoir would hold. And as a result of the project, uh, over 8,500 acres of wetlands have been permanently protected in 17 different specific um, project areas which are highlighted in this graphic. And in addition to uh, being much cheaper, than the proposed typical gray infrastructure alternative, 
there are, as we now know, huge additional benefits to the Charles River and the region that having all of these preserved wetlands have brought. Um, great water quality enhancements, which you don't get from gray infrastructure. Wonderful recreational opportunities. There's all kinds of boating and fishing and hunting uh, up in those wetland areas. And uh, they're, they're very beloved now by the people who live around them. So we've come a long way from, from uh, those early days of thinking that swamps were useless and they should just be drained so they could be built upon. Uh, but it's a, it's a very wonderful success story. Unfortunately, the Corps didn't replicate this approach very much across the country. And so most of the Corps' flood protection projects have remained concrete. But uh, we can certainly look back and learn a lot from the Natural Valley Storage Area Project. Um, briefly, I'm just going to talk about a few opportunities for green infrastructure that CRWA has been working on and thinking about in the Charles at the landscape, subwatershed, and street scale. This graphic shows um, in the green areas lands in the Charles that are forested or protected as recreational areas. So um, you can see some interesting things here when you think about green infrastructure at a watershed scale and look at this, it's very patchy. So there's not a lot of connectivity between these open spaces. I'm gonna step back here. Hello? Okay. So I think one thing that is pretty clear from looking at this is we, we do have a lot of green space left in the Charles, which is great. Um, and these big areas, especially that are very closely associated with the river, are the natural valley storage areas that I was just talking about. But um, it's interesting if you really look at this at scale to see that there's not as much protected green out here in the upper part of the watershed as you might expect. It's a lot in the sort of middle belt of the Charles. And then, you know, downtown, as you get into the Boston and Cambridge area, not so much again. And the, the main connector of all this infrastructure is the main stem of the Charles. Here's the downtown part. And its tributaries. And once again, if, another thing to note if you're thinking about green infrastructure at the watershed scale is out here in the upper and middle Charles, we still have many tributaries that are open and function and have their natural hydrologic shape and geomorphologic shape and function. Once you get down here, this is uh, 128, by the way, runs Route 128 or 995, right along about here. Once you get inside 128, almost no tributaries left. Of course, they're still there. They're buried in pipes under the city. One exception, the Muddy River. Another interesting thing about thinking about green infrastructure at the watershed scale is how different municipalities deal with their green infrastructure. And this graphic shows two different towns in the very upper Charles. Uh, most of the river you can see is flowing through the town of Milford on the left-hand side of the graphic. And, and on the right-hand side of the graphic, you see sort of, a, of some lines. And uh, that's the, those are the neighboring towns of Holliston and Medway. And you can really see that Holliston, in particular, has done a lot to try to protect its natural green infrastructure. Those green areas are protected open space that can't be developed. The town of Milford uh, doesn't choose to protect its open space, and so uh, the areas of the Charles that run through Milford obviously have a lot less long-term protection in terms of green infrastructure. And one thing to note, uh, this area right here you can see is still forested, but is completely unprotected, and that's where Milford was proposing to build a casino. So, um, you know, it's, it's, there's real development threats out there. It's not idle speculation. Um, this is a subwatershed area in Alston, right here in Boston, that uh, CRWA has spent a lot of time working with the city of Austin and the residents of North Alston and Harvard University. 
uh, which owns most of this land and is redeveloping their campus over there extensively. And uh, the idea here is really just to look at Um, I'll focus on this graphic, really. This blue line shows what used to be a natural stream, tributary to the Charles. It's now completely buried in pipes. These uh, lighter blue lines are smaller pipes that are all eventually connecting to this larger pipe. And this is uh, the science complex on Western Avenue that Harvard has been developing. You may be familiar with that. So our effort, really looking at this subwatershed scale, has been to try to think about green infrastructure from a neighborhood or, or sub-watershed scale. What are the opportunities all along the way here to recreate something that functions like a natural stream and maybe even daylight some portions of the stream. In other words, unbury the stream that's buried down there in a pipe. And you'll hear a little bit more about that from Tom in a minute. Um, this graphic just shows some ideas that have come from students. Um, the graphic on the left is for um, the Southwest Corridor Park in Boston. Underneath there is also a buried stream. And so uh, some students put together a, a design idea to put a little stream on the surface and create some little pocket wetlands and try and use the, that park as, as a way to bring back some of the natural hydrology. On the right, uh, is a vision created by some students of a former professor here named Vladimir Novotny in the engineering department who was a wonderful guy doing all kinds of interesting work and, and uh, was a lot of fun when I worked with him here. And so his students put his picture in this, in this wonderful vision. But under the street, the actual photograph there on the top is the Stony Brook, which Lee was just mentioning earlier. Uh, so, you know, there are big opportunities here if we want to actually reintroduce and reintegrate water into our urban environment. And then I'm just going to show you a couple of, um, I guess you call these visions that we've developed as we try to um, understand some of the opportunities for doing this work. So this is an actual place in Chelsea uh, that also has a stream running underneath it in a pipe. And so this is a, a vision of how that might, might look if we opened up the pipe and created some green infrastructure. And this uh, set of photographs comes from our work with the city of Austin on their Complete Streets program, which looks at um, trying to really update and improve streets as one of the city's um, best public realm assets. And again, an opportunity to just create a small pocket piece of green infrastructure in a very urbanized environment. So I've gone a little bit over my time. I think we have time afterwards for, for questions. Uh, so I'll probably hold off on taking your questions now. But um, again, my, my organization does all kinds of different work. I really just wanted to come today and, and talk a little bit about uh, sort of these types of green infrastructure opportunities that, from my perspective, integrate all kinds of different disciplines that universities like Northeastern are really focused on. So bringing engineers and landscape architects and planners um, and biologists and other scientists all together to try to figure out how to solve these water problems in a very urban context. And I'm happy to uh, introduce Tom Brady, who's going to really get into the nitty gritty of a specific project that is tremendously complicated and wildly exciting. Good evening, as Kate said, my name is Tom Brady, and just so you all know, it's nice to be here, yes, in the off season. <laughs> I do, if you go through the checklist, I have the right color hair, the right color eyes. My bride is Portuguese, so that counts. So I have been on ESPN before the Super Bowl. I've met the crafts. I do have a number 12 jersey. My weight is the same, it's just distributed differently. So I'm working my way there, so we'll get there. I am happy to be here tonight, as Kate said, um, and I was introduced earlier. I'm the conservation administrator of the tree ward in the town of for the town of Brookline, Mass. That means essentially I deal with all our green infrastructure. In my previous lifetime, before I came into public service, 
Um, I was on the construction side of things. I came out of college and decided to build uh, things such as, in the beginning it was ball fields and things like that. Turns out I had an axe for building uh, replicated weapons and things like that. So I've done a fair amount of that. What I want to do is uh, touch a lot upon what uh, Kate just spoke of. Uh, there's some nice synergy here, which is, uh, I, I tell you truthfully, is a nice coincidence. We both talked and did our projects individually, and there's a lot here. And what you'll see throughout, I think, my presentation is that we do, we are doing a lot now that we've done in the past. It seems like we're suddenly relearning things that made a lot of sense for a long time. So, um, and with that, I'm going to jump right in. I'll tell you that I'm going to talk about the Muddy River Restoration Project as kind of our, our framework. It's a cooperative effort between the city, the town, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. To understand it, I need to give you a brief history of the project. Essentially, it was authorized by Congress uh, starting back in 99. It's been authorized a series of times. Um, I can tell you that I have been involved with uh, one trip down to Washington to meet with the Assistant Secretary of the Army to talk about this project and to ask them to support it. We've had a series of generals who have come up uh, and met with us and done walkthroughs, folks who run the Corps of Engineers uh, across the country, all the way up to and including the Assistant Secretary of the Army came out. And the reason for that is this project is really outside of the Army Corps of Engineers' normal uh, operational comfort zone. So if that's the case, why did they decide to proceed? There were some key differences here, and it sounds kind of silly, but as you heard Kate uh, speak to, the Corps tends to be very hard solutions. A lot of concrete, a lot of armored banks, a lot of things that um, are pretty harsh. They are, don't disagree with their effectiveness, but they make a striking change to the landscape. Because of the approach they used here, we've had outstanding public and private support. When the generals come out from the Corps of Engineers, they're very frank. They're used to proposing a project and having hearing the hue and the cry against what they're proposing because it's going to be so harsh. In this case, we had unanimous consensus from folks across the board. The city of Boston, the town of Brookline, state of Massachusetts, we had spent a little bit over $5 million in design and planning before the court really came to the table. And working with the local state um, uh, emergency management folks, they were recognizing the urgency of the flooding problem and we actually took an early action item and uh, demonstrated that these types of actions could be effective, could be done, and made sense. <clears throat> so it's really, it's a comprehensive approach, starting on the, from the Charles River and working your way all the way back up through. The highlights in yellow mean that we're proposing to dredge. The highlights in blue mean that we're looking to do hard solutions, culverts, bridges, and such things. And those highlights in green mean that we're looking to do green infrastructure improvements. And we've made some progress on some of these already, and we're gonna go through it in some detail. I will tell you it's interesting that we've kind of bookended where we've started. The very far left of the slide, in the top corner, you see Restore the Badland Brook. That has been completed. I can tell you that was a fun project because we were mucking around in the stream, doing our work, restoring the stream, and we had a terrific contractor, and every time a citizen would stop and ask him what he was doing, he would tell them that he was tuning the Battle Brook. <laughs> and that just made sense to the folks. In the bottom right, in the corner, you see the Charles Gate Dredging Project. Next time you go to a Red Sox game and you're zipping underneath the Bout Rover Pass, turn your head to the left or the right. And you're going to see the last stretch of the Char the last stretch of the Muddy River before it goes into Charles. And I'm going to show you a photo where we actually took that and bypassed the entire Muddy River for a period of time so we could dredge it and clean it out and improve some flow. What are the major things we're going to do with this project? We're going to improve, we're going to protect against the flood, we're going to eradicate some of the fragmites, and we're going to preserve and restore the historic park shorelines and vegetations out here. And why? Well, the Corps has two charges by statute, flood and environmental. And this is the way it works, and it's kind of interesting to me as an environmental guy. If you're looking at a flood damage question, there's a straight statistical exercise that the federal government runs. If you meet an appropriate ratio of spending, of protection you're going to get based on the dollars you spend to provide that protection, then it's a straight up or down. It's very straightforward. When you go to the environmental portion of the side of the table, there is no threshold. It's a very subjective exercise. So if you elected the 
how many how much we're spending per dollar to provide for flood control and you consider the wide floods that took place in 96 and in 98 all the institutions that were severely impacted northeastern simmons emmanuel museum of fine arts uh, the hospitals uh, the t that was a no-brainer when you compare how much it's going to cost us in the middle of an urban environment to restore one acre of open water habitat compared to what they spend to do that in the Everglades or in the middle part of the country, we're not even close, folks. It's exponentially more expensive. There's good reasons for that, and there's good arguments for that. That's why it's clear we're outside of the course conference on this one. That's why we met with the Assistant Secretary of the Army several times uh, to keep this project moving forward. In 96, slightly north, frankly, of $70 million in damage. Uh, you can see the shaded areas. What's interesting is if you look uh, just below where it says Riverway, you'll see the area of shaded that indicates flooding travels and does not stay in that flood channel. And in some cases, in a drill pen, you see the back bay fence that floods. A lot of that's through those old straight line pipes that Kate talked about. They're still there. Uh, we, do, we do backward hydraulic connections, and it's not always a positive. This is a 96. This is my friendly concerned citizen making sure it is in fact flooded because he didn't believe us. So, and you can see Kenmore Station, this was closed for a couple months. Same year in 96, uh, elevation is up to 19.1. And that's a, a pretty tall order. How do we prevent that from happening now? A couple things happen. This is right down the street here at the Fenway Portal where they just had the enforcement accident the other day. Those are two portable dam structures. Every time we see a big rainstorm coming, we call Kate. Say, Kate, call your friend at the dam and have them pump down the Charles. Please, quickly. And then while they're doing that, we call the T. And we say, hey, MBTA, go out and put in two portable dams with big pumps and make sure that if the water overtops and tries to go down your tracks, so we don't lose the station again. But every time we do that, that entire branch of the Green Line is shut down for days. It's quite challenging and a bit problematic. It's important to remember the park is designed to flood. That was one of Mr. Olmsted's intent was to provide a storage area. The challenge we have is we're trying to put too much water in that storage area right now. This is the riverway. Many of you have probably walked it on the Brookline side. So and this is the META. Uh, every time they have a storm, they send uh, somebody who pulls the lucky straw to sit down here and watch them a mighty river gauge, and they will communicate via radio and say, now it's at elevation 13 and a half, elevation 14. I will tell you when we get to elevation 15, that's when we close the green line. So it's a system that works right now because I'm lucky enough to have Kate as my chair and I can call her and say, have them pump down the dam please. And because I happen to be able to call my friends at Boston Water and Soar and they go up and they take actions. It's a series of steps that since those storms of 96, 98, so far we've been lucky, but it's gonna come to an end. One of the big choke points, not too far from here, this is the Landmark Center. And uh, if you notice, kind of dead center of the screen, what's different than that photo that we don't have there now? Parking lot. A parking lot. People know why it's called the old Sears building. I'm making an assumption, sometimes people don't. Sears used to be there. Story goes, they went to the city and said, we're gonna move. We're gonna move because we don't have enough parking. The city made an arrangement with them in the early 50s to go ahead and pave over that land and put parking in. Probably not the best solution but it was something at the time. But if you also notice, to the left of the parking lot is the river. To the right, a fair distance is the river. In between those two points is two 72-inch culverts that were intended to carry the river from point A to point B that don't have enough hydraulic capacity to do that. Same situation, took the parking lot out, that's great, uh, but we still have that uh, problem of, of uh, choke point, if you will. The second big issue we have is if you look at these two photos, the black and white was the original configuration of the river close to it. If you look on uh, in the left, I'm sorry, the left is the black and white, and if you look to the right, you see light colored uh, phragmites all the way around. So that is an invasive plant that comes in. Turns out we've done some genetic testing on this. We're lucky enough to have a hybridized version of the phragmites. It can grow foot, foot and a half a year. It gets 12 and 14 feet in height. And uh, if you look a little closely at the color photograph, you'll see the largest building to the left, and that's the Boston Fire Department Dispatch Center. That's where they control everything for the whole city. Now, if you've been here for more than two years, 
You probably remember the day when it looked like that building was burning down, and it wasn't. It was the Phragmites. When the Phragmites catch on fire, they burn quick, they burn fierce, they throw a lot of smoke, um, but it's very hard to control. So, but from a hydrology, hydraulic point of view, you can see uh, the significant decrease in capacity there. It's just, there's a choke point. Um, those mass of Phragmites are so dense um, that you can literally walk out on them with two or three people. Don't do it. Sometimes people do that and they have a bad experience. It ends poorly for them. Because if you go through those Phragmites, you go through and they close back up over on top of you. Not a good thing to do. There's a third factor about why the mice have so many challenges in my opinion. Same photograph from the same angle, a few decades apart. What do you see in the black and white photograph that you don't see in the color? Open space. So we have finished filling the back bag because we need more land because we need to get rid of those icky vellums. We built on top of them when we filled it in and we caused more flow. Now when you look at stormwater conveyance, you have a couple different options. On the left, so it is kind of the traditional core approach, frankly. It's built, it's constructed, there's not a lot of maintenance there. From a dollar for dollar point of view, there's a lot of people that make a strong argument, or they feel it's a strong argument, that that's the way to go. On the right is our flood conveyance channel, it's designed by Mr. Olmsted. Thank you, Mr. Olmsted. On the left, and Kate spoke to this, what you remember is yes, the Los Angeles River was constructed, but so is the money. And we tend to forget that sometimes. Again, just to take a look, what are the different capacities um, when it flows through, what you get in Los Angeles? What we get. The park is designed to flood. I'm probably going to say that a few times. When we're done with the project, the park will flood. What we're looking to do is prevent it from overtopping the banks and going into the adjacent properties quite so much. Now, when you look, at moving that water downstream. There's essentially a couple different types of channels that you can do. And if it says, it says right up on top here, the limits of flood dredging improvements for typical. You can see it's very linear, very angled. Kind of looks like what that we just saw? Los Angeles River. Now, if you go to the environmental dredging, you get a wider cross-section, but you still have those angular sides of it. But why do you think we want to go with the environmental dredging? What are we going to catch that you won't catch if you do the flood control? You're going to get, you're going to allow more water, but you're going to get rid of those Phragmites. Phragmites encroach incredibly quickly, um, very, very quickly, and they will continue to creep in and creep in and take out the flood control channel that we just created. There are some additional benefits to the Phragmites control in that we increase fish habitat, we're going to increase the DO in the water, and we're going to provide more open water uh, for birds and such things. But most of it goes back to flood control. This is interesting and key because on the top of the slide, this is the current design that's being constructed out there right now. So if you look at the top, you'll see very close to this typical with wetland strip Sears parking, parking lot just underneath section C. It's a nice cross section. It's a little bit, a little bit more soft. But you see phrases that I like to see, like geo cells and geotext and topsoil and gravel bedding. And that's great. Now, if you look below that in section B, and this is where I kind of chuckle because it's there's a real engineering reason. But that is called ACB. That piece right there. That's articulated concrete blocks. I kind of feel like the core had to get their fix to get the concrete in here somewhere. You won't see it. It'll be under the water. It'll prevent the scour, which will be great. So, so we're going to have a nice, natural, um, effective solution to carry water. If you look at the bottom of the slide, that's what Mr. Olmsted designed over 100 years ago. Looks kind of similar. Same kind of cross-sections, same kind of ideas. We're going back to what he did before. The environmental problems we talked about a bit. The big one with water is, frankly, folks, is that if the water itself, literally the water, is fine. Uh, but when you get into the sediments that are underneath that water in the bottom of the river, 
they have collected all the stormwater that runs off. What we don't realize a lot is that the stormwater runs off from our streets, our roads, our parking lots, into wetland resource areas across the Commonwealth, for the most part untreated. Yes, we have some sediment controls. Yes, we have some wonderful things called oil hoods and we have more tech units to try and catch some of the stuff. But it's really, it's pretty tough. So um, it doesn't number on it. What's gonna happen when this is done, hopefully, um, is we're gonna get some better flood control. There is, floods are characterized by statistical events. We looked at a 20, a 25, and a 100 year storm event. We chose a 20 year storm event for the following reasons. One is it's gonna reduce uh, the amount of flooding that takes place. And second, and not significantly, to do, do a 25 year storm event, a level of protection uh, was the tipping point for that statistical analysis I talked about, because the culverts would have had to have been so enormous that they wouldn't really have fit and it would have been uh, very challenging. But by doing this 20 year protection, we're going to allow all the other events, the 25, the 30, the 35, the 40, to have a better likelihood of keeping that water inside the park, which will be great. From the environmental side, we're going to restore that aquatic habitat. We're going to enhance the diversity of the benthic, no more more our fish. So, and as we just talked about, we're going to try and get rid of these extensive stands of fried waves uh, so we can get a better diversity. This is the Charles Gate piece that I talked about. And you can see right on top, directly, you see the people standing on top of that. That's actually um, uh, one of the connector roads to the mass turnpike. And then further back beyond it is the turnpike itself. And you can see that we put up uh, a bypass system, we pumped the river dry, and we worked in there for about five and a half weeks. And I would be amazed if probably 100 people noticed what we were doing. So it can be done in a tough urban environment, but it's, a little, it's, it's challenging to say the least. That's, now that's all the background. Now let's talk about what we're doing right not, not too far from here. The first piece of the Muddy River project we have to do is get rid of that big choke point we talked about. So if you look at this, uh, these two diagrams, in the top, you see proposed phase one improvements, and down below you see phase one additions. So if I was doing this, if I was doing this graphic, I would have inverted it, but this is what we have. So let's look at the bottom one first. What we have is on the far left is you have the upstream portion of the uh, river that we looked at. It goes into those two 72 inch culverts that I talked about, travels underground, what is now green, what used to be a parking lot, goes underneath Brookline Avenue, goes underneath what is now the jug handle, goes into a small section of open water, and then goes into two more existing 22, 72 inch culverts. That is the primary choke point for the money. So everything upstream of that uh, can't flow down this way when we have a significant rain event. If you look above, so what we're going to do is we're going to go in, you see the white river coming in from the left. We've reduced, we've taken out two 72 inch culverts and putting in a 10 by 24 culvert. 10 feet high, 24 feet wide. We're putting a river back. How's that, how's that for a thought? Putting a river back where a river was. Think about this. We had a river. Mr. Olmes had designed it. It worked fine for decades almost the full generation. We decided it was inconvenient, so we put it in pipes. Who knows? Pipes didn't work. So now we're putting it back as a river. And we're spending $93 million to do this. It comes out of Brookline F. You'll notice that the jug handle is now gone. For the first six years of this project, we were told the jug handle couldn't go away. So we had two little tiny little sections of open water. The Corps of Engineers, to their credit, said, well, we should ask. They said, we've already asked. We should ask. Well, we already have. Went to a meeting. The engineer from the Corps of Engineers sat in front of the traffic engineers for Boston Transportation Department and the Department of Conservation and Recreation and said, this can work, and laid out all his pieces. And we got done with the meeting. We all waited for everyone to say, it can't work. And everyone said, yeah, you can get rid of the jug handle. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, that's good. So we got more river. We're spending less on solid concrete solutions. We're spending more on natural solutions, which makes sense. As you follow the river down to the right, you're going to see an island there in the middle of the river. Anyone want to guess why the island is there? In the options, I would give you a landscape feature, point of interest. Any ideas? Something's on it. I like that guess. It's actually the hydraulic purpose. Yes. Was it there before? Interesting question. What was the question? Was it there before? 
And Mr. Olmstead designed this, he had an island there. Mr. Olmstead sort of surmised that as you came around this corner, took the sharp corner, essentially the river comes down, hooks a hard right, runs about a three quarters of a mile and hooks a sharp left. So there's gonna be a lot of flow there. So he put an island there to break up the flow and slow it down. We're putting the island back. So we're saying thank you, Mr. Olmstead, that was a good idea. People walk by and say, that's a pretty landscape feature, and it is. But underneath the water, the core will get their little cement fix, and we have articulating concrete blocks to keep it safe. How are we doing this? Brookline Ave. On one end of Brookline Ave, I'll give you a hint. On one end is Fenway Park, right? What's in the other direction? Longwood. The major medical area for the East Coast. When we would bring the Assistant Secretary of the Armies up and they would say, why is it so expensive to do this project? We would say, we would turn to the nice general's assistant and say, sir, can you help us with something? And they were always very polite because they were military guys and say, yes, sir. Could you please count the number of ambulances that pass over Brookline Ave where we need to put the new culverts in the next 20 minutes when we talk to your general? Absolutely, sir. And it was always in the order of magnitude of 30, sometimes 40. I think the highest we hit was like 52 ambulances. It's insane. Underneath Brookline Ave are all the utilities that serve the hospital district. Well, you guys were all in class the last year and a half. We quietly went in because it's the responsibility of the non-federal sponsors to move the utilities out of the way. We moved Comcast lines, Verizon lines, NSTAR lines, Verizon business lines, all the communications from the hospital district. A six inch six inch diameter high pressurized gas main and my personal favorite the eight inch high pressure gas main that supplies the hospital district we moved those all out of the way so that the work could happen that you see going on now that all went fine which is great i tell you i was out of town when we tapped the eight inch train because it didn't want to be here just in case <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a when the core looks at this this is the type of thing they look at and say the, their initial reaction is, well, it can't, can't be done, or it can't be done efficiently enough to make the taxpayers' dollars worth it, because you have too many utilities in the line. And this is how we showed them that we could actually make it happen. These are all now out of the roadway. They're in that area where the parking lot used to be. They're buried temporarily underneath the ground, and they're covered in steel plates. And on top of them right now is the entire construction zone for the work we're doing. So we're about to start moving them back. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. This is the actual construction diagram of what they're out there building right now. So if you look over to the left, you're gonna see that we start right here. At, this is where the Mighty River comes down. Here's the old 72 inch culverts. Everyone see those okay? Okay. Here's the new culvert that we're putting in. Here's the river that we're putting back. We're take, putting a river back that we covered over our pipes. Comes into the next section. Here's the new culvert that's going in. Then we're going to go across, take out the jug handle, and put in the new river. Easy, right? No problem. Well, while you've all been driving down this little rotary right now, this detour, including myself, we built half this culvert right now is in place. We're covering the culvert back over right now, literally today. And then we're going to shift the traffic and we're going to build the next section of new culvert. While that's happening, we need to take all those utilities we just talked about, put them back where they go in their permanent location. Because now they're exactly, those temporary utilities are exactly here where we want to put the river. So we need to put them back. People say when they look at this from Washington, that's a lot of work for a river. We're not doing it for a river. We're doing it for flood control. The fact that we're doing flood control by building a river is a huge added bonus from my point of view. Instead of those hard concrete barriers and those hard concrete sides that you saw in LA, we're gonna plant. We're gonna plant thousands and thousands of plants. So um, three different layers of shrub rows, a new layer of wetland vegetation, we're mimicking exactly what Kate just talked to you about in the Upper Charles Watershed. We're trying to create that here. Um, I think it will be done successfully. Where do we get our ideas? 
hey, guess what, Mr. Olmstead? This is 1887, these are his original plans overlaid with existing conditions. And if you take a look at it, this is interesting, and you really have to focus here. But up in this area, you see where that path goes across? That, because we're overlaid over existing conditions, that's a parking lot. But you see all the trees on either side of the space? That's because he had, all together now, a river. He knew what he was doing. He was very, he was, the, the man was extraordinarily gifted about thinking these things through. When you think about taking a natural tide action, using those contours and those water levels from where the Charles River Dam is now, forget the dams there, making that work all the way up, all the way up the Mighty River, miles of, this, miles of gradient, and it all worked quite effectively. Take a closer look, and I just like to put this up, because it's amazing when you think about it. This was drawn, how many people here have had the opportunity to use uh, either AutoCAD or the GPS units? So I use those now, yep. Isn't it funny how you go out and stand next to a light pole and you GPS it, and you go back inside and it's like 12 feet off, and it's supposed to be sub-meter accuracy? These plants were drawn over 100 years ago, folks. Look how close this pathway is there. So when you take that level of detail and that level of uh, skill and you apply it to the muddy and apply it to the flood control features that he, that he installed and that he built, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. People say, well, what about the traffic? It's a good question. It's fun traffic out there right now. This is how it works now, you all you all know that. It's like to put out, this is a nice straight arrow right there. So this is this is the hospital district. Johnny Park is up this way. Theoretically, you only drive straight. No left turn, right? <laughs> Who's taking a left-hand turn there? <laughs> Everybody takes a left-hand turn there. Well, we decided to stop fighting the fight. Now you're gonna be able to take a left-hand turn. That's how I got rid of the jumping angle in a nutshell. So, tens of thousands of engineering, so hundreds of meetings. You can turn left, you can get rid of the jump handle. That's how we did it. What that does for me, as a green infrastructure person is, now, instead of having a small little piece of river that would have been here, with another box culvert that would have been here, with another piece of river on the other side, I can now have one continuous piece of river. Which means that my water resources help here, the river's gonna function better, flow's gonna be more effective. It's a win-win-win for everybody. And it actually costs less to build, which means that the Corps of Engineers, because that costs less, can actually participate and help us get rid of the jug handle. What are we building right now in those holes we drive by every day? Yes, they really are 10 by 24 box culverts. That's a 10 by 24 box culvert. So, that you're looking at there. Uh, they come in sections very, 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 very early in the morning. So they come up and they come through with all sorts of flashing lights and they park on the site until we can pick them up and put them in place. So this is what they look like when they're getting placed. So um, it's, it's an amazing process to watch. Um, it's, it's an incredible amount of skill that these guys have. The tolerance for fabricating and placing these is less than a 32nd of an inch. And they're fabricated in Tennessee and they come out here and they fit. So it's really, it's, it's, it's a neat thing. This is kind of a once in a career thing for someone like me. Here you can see them kind of going down into, into form. Um, it's working pretty well. When you're building stuff like this in the city, uh, there are no easy challenges. Among the utilities, I forgot one, the 48 inch water main that supplies Longwood. I bad. We had to relocate that too. So what we're doing with that is that's actually going to come out of the ground. It's going to come up above ground and run along the sidewalk. We had to do that so we can put in a large culvert to carry the water to get the flood conveyance to allow the river to work. So one interesting piece about this is that in my opinion, I found as I've gone through life, it always goes back to people. Why do I say that? The guys in, I forget where this one came from, I think it was Ohio, worked very hard to fabricate this new 40 inch water main. And it came out in pieces. If you look behind the nice young man in the orange sweatshirt, you see it bend. Well, we got it all together and we started trying to fit the last piece in. Didn't really want to seem to fit in. So they turned this way, turned that way, turned this way, couldn't get it to fit. Took a picture of the phone, called up the company in Ohio and said, it doesn't want to fit. 
And I said, well, give us a couple minutes, we'll call you back. I looked up and called him back and said, yeah, well, uh, Frank Tanner put the planes wrong. So we built it the wrong way. The angles were wrong. So our bad, we're sending new one. So it, no matter how much technology we get, it always gets back to a person who's implementing that technology. We talked about the historic nature of it. And we're, Mr. Olmsted's work, we're being respectful of that. We have to be, it's a national historic landmark. First piece of the covered section, as if you look closely, that's pink granite. That's granite that matches the faces of the other bridges that are in the park. So that when it's done, it's gonna uh, fit in context, but still be effective. And that was all pre-attached. Now, as Kate mentioned, they constructed this since a long time. 1892 was started, it was completed in 1920. It's a fair bit of construction. So we're hoping to do it in a little bit less, maybe in about 10 years or so. Why did he do it? This was actually in part of the contract. Sanitary improvements, just as Kate said, of the money over to abate existing nuisances, avoid threatened dangers, and my personal favorite, the wholesome and seemly disposition of drainage from the river, which is exactly what Kate told me a few minutes ago. Tide comes in, tide goes out, everybody's happy. It all worked fine until we put the river in a pipe and the court built the dam. Hey, what are you gonna do? Now we're on domain. This is what it looked like the last time we built it. Who's walked over the Brookline Avenue Bridge when you're walking back over towards Brookline? And if you look in the background, you see a church it's up on the hill. You still see that when you're walking on the path. Look at those banks, see how they're contoured and shaped. If you think back to that earlier slide, when we looked at the, if you're looking top down, what we're gonna build for the river, they're contoured and they're shaped. So, Yes, it looks nice, but guess what, folks? It also has energy dissipation and cuts down on erosion, and it's an effective way to help us handle things. Anyone want to take a guess what this is? This is the Oh, first time I had somebody in the first guess, good guess. That is the gardener. That's the Elizabeth Gardener. As things are starting to grow in. But as you can guess what we, now what I see is when I look at this, is look at the banks. What do you see in the banks? Some scour. Same issues we're having now, back then. Same issues. This is jumping back. Now you can see, if you look close, that's the Brooklyn Avenue Bridge that has now been constructed. Things have grown in. It looks beautiful. Everyone walks around and says, this is a wonderful park. And it is tremendous. I strive in my career to get to a place to work to a place like Brooklyn. We have tremendous, tremendous natural resources in that community. It's a tremendous place to be. So, but people tend to forget it's a flood conveyance channel. That's what it's designed to do. And in case you think we've never been through this before, eighteen ninety four, the engineer to the board of selectmen saying, as we're building Mr. Olmsted's plan. If we don't clean out this basin once or twice a year, surplus material will flow and it will have to be bridged at a considerable expense. Pretty remarkable. So as we're going along and we're looking at our infrastructure and we're thinking about green infrastructure and we're looking to implement these things and we think, man, we just have it all. We have this all together. It sounds somewhat familiar, doesn't it? It's kind of neat to go back and look at what was done and what works. Apply those lessons now, and we have a benefit for all of us. And with that, I thank you for your time, and I appreciate your attention. Okay, so um, I guess I'll just kick off um, some questions to our panelists and then turn it open to the audience. Um, one thing that was, um, sort of interesting to me about this um, set of presentations was it tied in in a very interesting way to some earlier discussions we've had about climate change and um, the flooding um, maps as, as you may recall if you were here of what's going to happen as the climate um, changes we know that there's going to be more 
precipitation over time. We know that the sea level is going to be rising. Um, but thinking about it in a thorough way, as we heard, involves basically planning for 2050, you know, not, not just for dealing with today's storm surges and today's flooding, but actually, you know, thinking ahead. And so I, I was interested to ask both of you, um, first of all, whether you were seeing on the ground, a, a, in essence, a capacity of our institutions to, to think that far ahead, uh, for example, is the Muddy River Project, as it's currently configured, going to have a capacity that will deal with the year 2050? Or is it basically just coping with the flooding that we're facing, that we're facing now? And, and Kate, um, you too, I know, are thinking about green, in essence, green infrastructure in all of its, in all of its forms. Uh, you know, capturing water, um, holding it back. Are you seeing um, that kind of long-range planning um, coming into the, the government permitting and planning um, processes? Short answer, I would say no. <laughs> um, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, it's in terms of the regulatory and permitting and planning challenges, um, specifically in Massachusetts, we have been very slow. I think we are number 48 in the nation to update our precipitation uh, rainfall return curves. Uh, so the statistical analysis of rainfall patterns that's used by uh, planners and engineers in particular to size things. You know, how big does something need to be to carry this storm that is likely to happen once every 20 years or has a 5% return or whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, we're looking at very outdated data and the, the permitting processes and therefore the engineering designs that we're doing are based on uh, rainfall data that's 20 years out of date. So that's one big problem. It is being addressed. Um, the state is finally moving forward and getting those updated and we should have new um, statistical bases for designing our infrastructure within the next year or so. So that's good. Um, bigger picture, I think typically what we see is a problem of finance that a lot of institutions or even individual developers may uh, sort of put climate change scale designs into their projects initially. Uh, but when you look at the way we finance everything, you have to have a return on investment that fits X years. And typically climate change is uh, sort of the, the climate change impacts that we should be designing for are beyond the years of the return on investment. And so it gets value engineered out of the project. In other words, you can't justify spending that much money because you're, it will cost you more than it is worth in that present value. So uh, we have a couple of factors sort of working against us. Um, I would say there are some exceptions to that. Um, and institutions like universities uh, have different financial mechanisms and can do things uh, maybe with a different return on investment or can incorporate into their economic and financial analysis other benefits. Um, so they may, they may be able to sort of bring in some of the positive economic benefits to their financial structures to justify doing some of these things. The Muddy River Project is a great example of where we had to really work together as a, a tremendously interdisciplinary group of citizen activists and local government officials to try to figure out how to make the calculus work so the Corps of Engineers could participate in this project and it was not easy. Um, as, as Tom sort of alluded to, it was very challenging. I think um, the other piece that is really important when we think about that is to just think about the small scale efforts that we can do that will help in the long run. So a lot of those site specific green infrastructure designs I was talking about, if, if we can create a muddy river restoration project that's designed for the 20 year flood today, 
and if we can redevelop the watershed so that it holds water everywhere it falls a little bit better, maybe even with bigger precipitation events, we'll still have the same size flow going into the river at one time. So um, I think we have to look for really a lot of different ways to tackle um, figuring out how to do this in a scenario of a lot more precipitation and also longer droughts um, where we're gonna need to support trees for months on end sometimes with little or no rainfall. So um, it's, it's certainly, I'm not seeing a lot, but I'm, um, I'm hopeful, mainly just because I do think green infrastructure offers us a lot more opportunity to respond to climate, to a changing climate than gray infrastructure. What do you want to add to that? I concur. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just want to do that once. Um, I would say that I, I would, by and large, um, uh, be lockstep with Kate. I would say that from an, I am a conservation administrator and I'm bound by the Wetland, Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act any company regulations along the Brookline Wetlands Bylaw. But I would say and suggest to you that um, as an administrator, either as staff or as a member of the commission for um, over 20 plus years now, um, you are by and large seeing uh, many commissions and staff uh, shy away from uh, hard underground solutions to stormwater runoff. And I think that's for two reasons when we talk as amongst ourselves as administrators. One is that uh, if it's above ground and it's more green, um, oftentimes without even realizing it, you can nudge some more capacity out of these folks. Um, they don't actually realize it and you can get more bang for your buck. And two is if, if it starts to overtop above ground and that stormwater swell can't handle it and that rain garden can't handle it, then it's visible and it's in front of you. And by default, you're going to start to push and change along the way. So I would uh, concur it is, it is frustrating um, because intuitively you just know that the models are off. They're clearly wrong. So, and we need to get them fixed. So hopefully that's gonna happen in the near term. So I'll just, uh, about this one. there we go. Um, one more question I had um, has to do with stormwater pollution, uh, many of you may know that the, the Federal Clean Water Act has only recently started to be f fully implemented um, with respect to stormwater pollution that goes out from municipalities uh, generally through pipes into waterways. And, and so you're seeing, in just legal terms, some in enforcement and some implementation of new relatively new regulatory requirements uh, that many people thought should have been in place before. But the, the honest truth is this, this most recent decade is the one where we're starting to see um, new requirements put on municipalities to control the quality of their, their stormwater pollution. And my sense is that that setting, that enforcement setting by the federal government and the state governments is actually driving a lot of quite interesting green infrastructure initiatives as the cities and towns have basically had to face up to their legal duty to control stormwater um, pollution. So I guess I was interested to ask, um, um, Tom, I guess first, um, are you seeing that actually in, in Brookline, that the stormwater, the actual municipal stormwater requirements is leading to designs by the city to install some of these, in essence, natural filters along parking lots? I think it's an interesting question. I think that um, uh, based on my experience, sometimes when you get into those enforcement hearings, um, the tenor is not one that is helpful to have productive discussions, frankly. Um, so I think that in our experience uh, as a town, we need to get past that, and we need to do a fair amount of convincing that the original uh, approach um, we felt was inappropriate. It was way down by the river where we were trying to catch stuff, and we wanted to spread further up that stream and further up into that watershed and find those problem areas further up. And it took some convincing to allow to do that. Um, so, I think that it's, it's overdue for, uh, I, I think, um, 
CSOs need to go away. I think that combined we, sewer overflows. Combined sewer overflows need to go away. I think we can do a better job of, of treating our stormwater before it goes. I just think again, that I alluded to it in my discussion, it oftentimes goes back to people. It's if you have the right people in the room trying to find that solution, you can have those good productive discussions. And I think yes, it, it, it could work well. But I've been in a variety of settings at different times for that. Sometimes it's productive and sometimes it's not so much. <laughs> So, um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's clearly positive. I think there's such a lack of awareness that it, that it, when it goes down that catch basin and off that road, that um, it, it does, it, it goes to a wet resource area. People just are, are completely unaware of that. And I think uh, that's true of, res that's true of residents, citizens, elected officials, in many cases, department heads. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity for education and fix those issues. What about you, Kate? Have you seen some interesting initiatives come out of just stormwater and water quality um, concerns? Yeah, um, I think it's very interesting. Since I work in the whole watershed and I work with 35 municipalities, um, I think the comment I would make is it's amazing to see how the same set of regulations and requirements are driving a lot of different responses across the 35 towns. So you have some towns that are quite um, proactive and progressive and, and working hard and finding new money to spend and, and uh, implement things, including some very interesting green types of projects, um, using vegetation and rain gardens and other types of things, and then other municipalities that are really not interested and are basically uh, hoping that they can just ignore it. Um, I also think, and I really agree with Tom, that it's a, um, great opportunity to get people to think about um, what what this is about. Politically, it's a really difficult time. Um, we are now up against uh, phrases like a rain tax. Why are you imposing a rain tax so we can pay for all of these outrageous projects? Um, rain is comes from nature and it's clean. Why do we have to pay for it? And of course, you know, people used to feel that way about sewage. Explain what a rain tax is. A rain a tax. Water fee. Explain. A stormwater fee, sure. So some municipalities have to do these projects. They're mandated by the EPA under regulations or even under court orders. They have to raise money somehow. So many municipalities are starting to impose a fee, what's called a stormwater fee, uh, to pay for the work and it makes good sense to me. I, I, you pay for your water that comes into your house, you pay for wastewater treatment of your sewage that you generate. Why not also pay for the cost of controlling and cleaning the stormwater that runs off your property into the public drain in the street? Um, but people don't like to pay for things, and so instead of stormwater fee, we're calling it, some people are calling it a rain tax, which sounds really bad, I guess. <laughs> But uh, so, you know, politically we're up against some, some real challenges, but uh, I, I think we're making progress. And, and personally, I, I value um, the Clean Water Act tremendously, and I think it's the right thing to be moving from wastewater, which is really what the first uh, decade or two of the Clean Water Act focused on, into the stormwater area, because that's now the biggest source of pollution to our rivers and harbors in the country. I'd love to open it up to some questions from, from all of you. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, just, just a comment that uh, one of the best books I ever read is A Clearing in the Distance, which is a biography of, of Olmsted. It, it's just a fabulous book. So somebody who's not sick of reading textbooks and would like a really great read, I highly recommend that book to you. Um, I'm wondering if in the planning for this project that, Tom, you focused on, um, in addition to the vegetables of the flood control, was there a component of the access to the new part of the uncovered river that was considered? And what um, makes me think about this is the success of what happened in Providence when they uncovered their river and they got brought in Barnaby Evans to do water fire, which is has it must have a tremendous economic impact every time they have water fire in Providence. So in terms of getting that dessert with the vegetables or the, the added bonus of access, and I think about what they did in New York with the High Line and what they've done in the upper um, West
west side of New York along the Hudson with that park that's going up from the piers up along the, the Hudson River with the art and everything. Was there a component of this on the, on the sort of surface level that was um, additional access? Uh, it's, it's a good question, Phyllis. You know, the question was about um, uh, access. Do we consider access and increased uh, traffic in the area once it's put back in its riverine state as opposed to being under the ground in pipes? And the answer, the answer to that is that at our planning level, we did. When you get involved with the core, you have to be very specific. They only have those two regulatory requirements that they can get involved for. One is for environmental restoration, the other is for flood control. So um, all other aspects, ranging from historic to access, um, they say, well, that's very nice, but it doesn't help us with our, our, our calculations to prove this is a good investment. Um, but there was careful consideration of you know, appropriate pathways, um, and frankly, access both ways, so people can see it visually and enjoy it. But um, there was a recognition to make sure that um, uh, the plant return, once it goes in, the riverine environment, once it's restored, is not uh, completely wide open. There are some what we call Olmstead beaches, which are grass areas right down to the water's edge to make sure you have good viewpoints. Um, and so there, there should be some good access there. Um, I'm hopeful and we're all surmising that once this is opened up, the significant traffic we get in the other areas of the necklace is just gonna continue right on. And I can tell you that uh, the new owner of the Landmark Center sees the projects going across the street from him as a huge amenity and a huge benefit to, to, to him and the colleges around it have viewed it in the same manner. So um, we do expect more traffic and we have uh, done our best to account for that with appropriate paths and uh, controls and things like that. Yes, please, go ahead. Kate, what did you say was the largest source of pollution in the Charles River? Stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff? Yes. And would you say the same for the for the money? Yes, mm -hmm. even more so. Even more. Wow. Because there on the Charles River we do have uh, five wastewater treatment plants that discharge treated effluent and uh, there are still some um, not really industrial but uh, practices that, that you know, like there's some gravel pits and quarries and orchards and uh, things that do cause other types of pollution. In the Muddy River, pretty much the only source of pollution is stormwater runoff, plus um, some of the sediments that are already in there, you know, are contributing to some of the water quality problems as well. But its source is all stormwater. What is the likelihood of daylighting the Stony Brook? <laughs> Um, breweries, 
Uh, right, a lot of it is under big streets, um, and it does, part of it anyway, flows under, I believe, Ruggles Street and Forsyth Street here. Um, I uh, remember when I first came here to teach, they, they were doing work on the part of Stony Brook that goes under Forsyth Street, and it was fantastic to see because basically the uh, the, the, the great stone granite um, culverting um, that was there from, I guess, the 19th century was, was visible to those of us who were in town. So it's a fabulous bit of infrastructure right here, um, right, right by us. But there is a, a street that goes on top of it. Just to add to that, um, uh, you mentioned Novotny. Novotny, yes. Novotny, who used to teach here, he retired. He has, I don't know if it's in his textbook or, or, or it was a project with students, but he had a project that visualized. Kate had the um, slide up there. That was from that project yeah, that Vladimir and, and there's Novotny a lot did. of visuals, of, and I guess it's just right on Forsyth Street. Yes. Is, is where, where it's running in front of Lou's. If you stand yeah. in front of Lou's lunch, you would, you would <laughs> peer down into the stream. That was the, the vision that they were playing out there. I, I would just add a little more observation. When I looked at that visual, it reminded me how many times during the Muddy River Project we've heard the word "no, it can't be done," and it can be done. It just it, it, it needs to be persistent, take time, uh, do some education, learn the other people's points of view, sort out what you can and can't change, and and you can make it happen. So I, I agree with Kate. Fifty years is it, possible. Um, but in the short term, it would be tough. Might take some big floods. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Who else? Yes, please. Go ahead. I was just wondering about the articulated concrete blocks. I, I guess I couldn't quite picture them. And I was wondering, do they allow water to flow? Uh, are, are they connected to the aquifer or not? I guess I would uh, uh, picture um, your Nana's Afghan which had, oh, your grandmother's afghan, which had all sorts of pieces of fabric of all these voids in between the pieces of fabric. That's what an articulated map looks like. It's pieces of little concrete blocks with big void spaces in between them. So it's like a big blanket that you can twist and, and place wherever you want. And the purpose of that is that as the water comes down and it's gonna come through those new 10 by 24 culverts, even with the meandering during a good sized storm event, it's gonna come at a pretty good velocity. So the concern is that if you don't have that articulating concrete mat under the water where you won't see it in front of that new headwall structure, it will scour and it will dig it out. So that's the that's so that's kind of how it looks, and that's that's what it does. It's like a giant a giant blanket with all sorts of weight spaces on it. It just happens to weigh several tons. And it's just gonna go on either side of the culvert or it's gonna line the entire muddy river? It's just gonna go probably, I think it's uh, about 32 feet in front of uh, the culvert on this side, and then when it comes out of the culvert on the other side, it's a little bit closer to 36 or 37 feet out from the opening, I believe. Um, and that's just, the, just a, it's a protection measure. And that new island that we're putting in, will have it under, underneath the water surface as well, so that doesn't scrap it out either. Yes, I think uh, this question, I think is Kate, uh, with the rain gardens, um, have you been having success with those 35 towns and convincing them to do those small measures? Because those are pretty small, uh, effective measures that a, a city or town can do. We should repeat the question, perhaps. The question was whether the rain gardens um, have been successfully adopted in the, in the towns that Kate was speaking of. Some yes, some no. Um, different towns have a different approach, and also different towns have different physical um, limitations, I guess I would say, or different opportunities. So mostly where we're seeing a lot of rain gardens and those kind of small, relatively inexpensive types of design solutions are farther in the outer watershed where there's, um, their, their buildings are set back maybe farther from the sidewalk they're typically, they often have medians in the middle of the, of the street. Um, many of them actually still have uh, what's called country drainage uh, behind the sidewalk. They just have ditches, basically. Um, so they have a lot of, it's also common, I'm sure everyone has seen a cul-de-sac 
you know, which is typically a huge round paved area with uh, lots of space. Uh, so you can actually build a, an island in the middle of one of those that can function as a rain garden. So in the suburban areas, um, we're seeing a lot more of those simpler infrastructure designs. In a place like Boston, which actually has uh, recently adopted a new complete streets guideline, so uh, really how streets in Boston are going to be redeveloped in the future. Um, it has a variety of components for bicycling and access, but uh, also a green component. And so in, in those kind of areas, much less space, lots of underground infrastructure, much more complicated engineering requirements. Um, you're seeing rain gardens that are really structured, very heavily engineered, um, carefully designed and sized. So they're not really what I would call a rain garden, um, but they are still a little piece of green infrastructure. And actually in places like along the medical area um, and at some of the universities or downtown uh, where you're seeing very expensive new developments go in, we're seeing little pocket rain gardens and little pocket stormwater treatment systems as well as things like green roofs, um, even some green walls we're now seeing. In Cambridge, there's actually a blue roof. Um, so there's a whole host of tools in the toolkit for new developers. Um, and we are seeing, especially on private property, a lot of those kind of innovative structures. The municipalities we would work with are mostly doing the simpler kinds of structures. Kate, okay, explain what a blue roof is. And or a green roof, for that roof. matter, yes. Um, a green roof is can be built on pretty much any roof, although they're typically built on flat roofs. And there's all different kinds of them, but they're pretty much what they sound like. Some way to turn the roof of a building into something like a planted garden. And uh, the value of that, obviously, is it's beautiful. It helps cool the environment with evaporation. And from a water perspective, it absorbs and treats rainwater as it falls. Some obviously still does drain out, especially in larger storms, but the water that drains off those roofs comes off more slowly and is much, much cleaner. Um, difficulties with green roofs are old buildings typically don't have a roof that's strong enough to hold all the weight of all that soil and plant and water, plant material and water. So you have some of those challenges. Um, obviously, sloped roofs are, are much more challenging than flat roofs. A blue roof, is uh, basically saying, well, we're not going to bother with the soil and the plants. We're just going to build a like a pool up here that's going to hold the water and release it slowly into the system. So it's like a big storage tank that you an open storage tank that you put on your roof. Um, but Cambridge, for example, has some of the toughest stormwater requirements for new developments of any any city, um, and. They require any new building to be able to control the 25-year storm, which is a huge rain event. Um, so it's a very expensive and demanding design um, challenge. And so as a result, Cambridge is seeing some of the most innovative uh, stormwater management going in. Um, and I think all of the cities around are kind of benefiting from and learning from that lesson. Yes. Please. I have two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm not familiar with the demographics of this area. However, one thing that stood out to me is the uh, $70 million um, as a result of past events. And you mentioned the public health uh, effect also. Do you have any related health data in terms of uh, diseases or so that are related to these past events of the drugs? Uh, so the question was, um, I take it what 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 public health Im implications are are uh, potentially being addressed by um, either the historical um, structures or the the current current plans. Yeah, I can tell you that the, the seventy million dollars um, a, a fair amount of that comes from the fact that the MBTA the regional transit system got devastated, and that was a significant amount of the damage that came from that as was, for example, the neonatal intensive care unit up the street at one of the hospitals got wiped out because they had old pipes that tied into the river and the river came right up through and came up into the neonatal units. Um, one of the sub-basements for the Museum of Fine Arts got inundated, so they lost a, a, a fair amount of work there. Um, so that's where the dollar figure comes from. 
from those types of studies. Um, I'm not off the top of my head familiar with anything that goes back to the public, the public health aspects of it, to be honest with you. Um, I think that everything flows pretty well uh, out of understanding water issues. The issues that we have really are that when uh, the river level comes up, um, and some have been retrofitted, but there's still a fair number of pipes that will back water and carry the water back up through the system a half mile, three quarters of a mile, a mile away from where the river actually is and pop up. Um, sometimes in the street, sometimes in the ball field, sometimes in someone's storm drain and that's in their building, you never know. So. In the, I guess I would just add, in the, in the background, uh, historically, of course, the, um, the original origins of the Muddy River project and Olmsted's design was, was tied in, I think, quite a bit with just dealing with plain old human sewage, as Kate, as Kate was mentioning, and that was, of course, a huge public health issue at the time, and we see um, in our landscape now the effects of, of sanitary engineering. First of all, to bring our water, our drinking water, in Boston from ever further away, it, since it comes now from the Quabbin Reservoir, we didn't actually overlay that map of that, that great infrastructure project of, of literally bringing drinking water from the Connecticut River watershed over the mountain, so to speak, and down here into Boston uh, in order to have clean, clean drinking water for Boston. Um, some people, um, I, I believe that the, um, the problem of combined sewer overflows in, in Boston continues to be obviously uh, um, at, its, at its heart of um, a public health concern that's driving some of these efforts to uh, keep the sanitary sewage from basically being mixed with the storm water as it, as it does do in, down here in the, in the lower basin in places. So, so these, um, in terms of um, water quality regulation, some of the most powerful projects that have, or most expensive projects that have been going on certainly down here. Um, and we heard a little bit about this in our last session, um, have, have had to do with keeping the stormwater separate um, somehow from the sanitary sewage and keeping it from spilling out into the into the Charles River. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, my second question was the, the pervious uh, pavement material. I'm very amazed by that. Is that something that for Morris can buy at Home Decor? Is it? <laughs> oh, the second question had to do with pervious <laughs> pavement? Okay. And, and can you buy it at Home Depot? Um, it's, it's a really interesting emerging technology. Um, it's not easy to buy and install. Um, it does require that you work on the subsurface a lot more than regular pavement, and so that's a big challenge in the city because if you're gonna put on a coat of porous pavement, you want the water to, to, to go through it. Basically, it, it's if you know anything about it, pavement, and I don't, I'm sorry, I'm just repeating what I've been told. Um, but basically to make porous pavement, you just remove a lot of the fine uh, material. So you're, you're mostly dealing with larger pieces of aggregate, basically, and then you glue it all together with the same asphalt material. Um, so you want the water to run through it. You need to have space underneath the porous asphalt for that water to drain into. If, if the water goes through the asphalt and then just can't sink into the ground and starts building up, uh, it would very quickly destroy the asphalt. Um, it would freeze and crack and you'd have a lot of problems. So you need to make sure that you have a sub-base underneath the porous asphalt that's usually filled with gravel so it's very strong and it can support trucks and vehicles, uh, but it can allow that water to drain down. And um, we are seeing more and more of it being uh, used in urban environments. Um, engineers by nature have to be very cautious. They use everything they learned in the past to safely design for the future. So change is, is a slow process in the engineering field. But there are some really interesting um, sort of innovative test projects or pilot projects being done using forest pavement of different kinds. 
pavers, uh, actual porous asphalt, porous concrete, um, precast con porous concrete blocks, um, all kinds of different materials that are being tested. There's a, if you're interested in going to see one, um, there's a pilot project that's been built by the Boston Architectural College in the South End. Um, they had an alley behind their building, so between Newbury Street and Boylston Street, I think it's Hereford, is the cross street. Um, it's very well signed. They have these big blue circles on the, on the ground that, that tell you what, what it is, and it's a, a, a porous asphalt alley that they've constructed um, to sort of look at and test and see how it works. And so far, uh, it was completed in June of last year, and so far they've never had any overflow from the alley that they could even measure. All the rain that comes down onto the alley, including from some surrounding rooftops, um, is just sinking straight into the ground, and none of it is overflowing. So our uh, CRWA is also working with the city of Boston on developing uh, a similar, different design, but um, a green, a porous alley um, in near, kind of near Copley Square. Um, also in the, in the South End. So uh, lots and lots of opportunities, I think, to use more porous asphalt and porous materials for hardscape in cities where you need it. But you can't buy it at Home Depot yet. <laughs> So thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Um, this concludes our session. Hope to see you again next week.